So today's webinar was being recorded and a link to the archive version will be shared on our website and social media accounts and sent to all registrants via email as well. So welcome everyone to the power of licensing today's session of the Rutgers Business School Signature Leadership Series. Today's webinar is offered in valued partnership with Tech United NJ and we thank them for their support. The Rutgers Business School Signature Leadership Series is a learning opportunity that brings our audience lessons of resilience, resourcefulness, responsibility, and reinvention through conversations with thought leaders and business leaders from across industry spectrums. I'd like to begin by telling you a little bit about today's presenter. Michael Stone serves as chairman and co-founder of Beanstalk, a leading global brand licensing agency that is part of Omnicom Group. He's also the author of The Power of Licensing, Harnessing Brand Equity, and has been inducted into the Licensing International Hall of Fame in 2019. Under Michael's leadership, Beanstalk has been responsible for some of the all-time most successful licensing programs, including programs for Harley-Davidson, the Coca-Cola Company, Procter & Gamble, AT&T, Ford Motor Company, Stanley Black & Decker, the US Army, and HTV, HGTV, among others. Michael is a widely sought after authority on licensing and is frequently cited in top print and broadcast media outlets. He's also a frequent contributor to Forbes. Michael has served as an adjunct professor of brand licensing and has been a frequent guest lecturer on licensing at several institutions. Michael earned his JD from Emory University School of Law and his BA in government from Hamilton College. Now it is my pleasure to introduce our moderator. Karen Chaco is Senior Vice President Brand Management of Beanstalk where she oversees the New York brand team consisting of four business units, each responsible for multiple Beanstalk clients. She has over 20 years of experience in strategic brand extensions, new business, partnership development, and client management. Karen is responsible for supervising the brand team's activities in the areas of client service, licensee management, sales, product approvals, and brand strategy. As brand team lead, Karen also oversees staffing needs for new clients and works closely with the new business development team throughout the process. In addition, she heads up Beanstalk's North, American, North America Manufacturing Representation Practice Area, where Beanstalk represents manufacturers seeking brands outside of the existing portfolio of clients. Karen earned a BA in communications from SUNY Cortland. She also completed the advanced and senior management programs through Omnicon University. Karen is a proud Rutgers mom and a proud Rutgers alumni wife. So um, welcome to you both. Thank you. And Karen, I'm gonna let you take it from here. Great, thank you, Margaret. And thank you for hosting us here today. Uh, we are excited to be speaking to everyone, but we thought before we get started, since you already met us through those great intros, thank you. Uh, that we would give you a little background on what licensing is since that is really the core of what we do. And just to put it in simple terms, licensing is when a brand owner, um, or in our case, licensor, grants a third party, which is a manufacturer, retailer, or some other service, uh, which is the licensee, permission to use that brand to develop or sell a product uh, that would utilize that brand's logo or attributes or even flavor pro profile, as you see below, um, in, in exchange for a royalty, which is a percentage of their wholesale sales. So it's really about kind of leasing out your brand, but still having approval rights over it. And here you'll see Bailey's as the licensor or brand owner partnered with Great Spirits, which is the licensee or manufacturer to create these beautiful and delicious cakes and uh, pastries. So they're using not only the brand, but also some of the flavor profiles to sell that to retail. And I'll hand it over to Michael on the next slide. Yeah, so uh, first of all, thank you for having me and thank you, Margaret. Um, so licensing is really an important part of the marketing mix. And as you know, as we talk about reinvention, which is one of your four R's, licensing really has reinvented itself 
over the course of my 30 year career. So if you think about it, what we do is we take a client like Bailey's and we learn about the brand, we learn about what their marketing objective, objectives are, and then we come up with a plan of, uh, of how can we extend their brand into other product categories that will achieve the objectives they have uh, for marketing. So licensing really over the past 10 years has come to be recognized as an effective way to tell a brand story, to communicate a brand message, to connect with consumers, to strengthen brand meaning, to burnish a brand reputation. So if I stick with the Bailey's example, Bailey's of course is a creme liqueur. It's, it's utilized mostly during holiday periods and almost exclusively in the evening or at night. And Bailey's wanted their brand to be used throughout the, throughout the year and they wanted it to be used in different parts of the day. Not the alcohol, but they want the brand. They want consumers to be utilizing the brand at different parts of the day. So that led us to the strategy of licensing the brand into food categories like chocolates and cake and coffee creamers uh, and, and baking products and things like that, which allow consumers to use the brand at different parts of the day and to think of the brand as more than just an alcoholic drink. To think of the brand as, as the way Bailey's describes it, as an indulgent treat. Um, so I'll, I'll give one more example. Uh, Mr. Clean, we all know Mr. Clean is a liquid cleaning product. Uh, well, P&G wants it to be known in a broader context. They want it to be known as a household cleaning brand, not just the liquid cleaner. So how do you do that through licensing? Well, you license the brand for other cleaning products like brooms and mops, uh, magic erasers, things like that, that allow the brand to expand its meaning to consumers and to achieve, help achieve the objective that P&G has to, to, um, to redefine what the brand Mr. Clean means. So over the past 10 years, I would say, licensing has really evolved and reinvented itself as a very effective communications tool. And maybe I should say over the past 20 years, 15, 20 years, because the internet changed everything, right? We used to get all of our brand messaging through television and print advertising, and the internet turned all of that on its head. And now there are so many different ways to communicate a brand message that brand owners started looking for where are the pathways to communicate our brand message. And they realized, hey, licensing, which is really, I would describe as an analog tool, licensing is an effective discipline to, um, to communicate brand messages. So uh, it's, it's become, and that's basically the, the thesis of my book uh, is uh, looking at licensing through, the, through that lens. So on the next slide, I think we'll have some examples where you can see where brands, these are not br products that are being made by those brand owners, but actually by licensees or, or third party manufacturers. Um, and Bailey's, you'll see there the Mr. Mr. Clean example that Michael used and some other examples of how these can fit into your marketing mix. So Stanley Black & Decker is a conglomerate of different brands. You have Stanley Black & Decker, DeWalt, um, and Craftsman, where DeWalt is really focused on the professional, Black & Decker more on your, your homeowner, the person that just wants to be able to do things themselves with something simpler, and then Stanley and Craftsman somewhere in between your do-it-yourselfer and your professional. However, each of their programs, they find ways to partner with best in class manufacturers to drive traffic back to the core by also offering products that allow each of those people to complete their job um, at whatever level experience that they have. So you'll have products that are that look and, and feel seamless from, from each of those brands and you wouldn't know that they were being made by other manufacturers. Let me just interrupt for one second, Karen. One thing that I also want to say to the people that are listening in so that they understand licensing. Uh, I mean, all of you are probably familiar with licensing because you own a New York Yankees, you know, baseball cap or a McDonald's coffee mug, or maybe your kids own some frozen, you know, Disney frozen products or something like that. Or but, a Rucker sweatshirt. Yes, or a Rucker sweatshirt. <laughs> but, you know, all of these corporate brands are doing licensing as well. And so for an agency like Beanstalk, uh, our job is not only to understand the brand, develop a strategy for a licensing program that will meet the brand's objectives, find the licensees, 
negotiate contracts with them between the brand owner and the licensee. But then a good portion of our job becomes managing the licensees. So for all of our clients at Beanstalk, we have hundreds and hundreds of licensees making thousands of products uh, all around the world. And so the management of all of that uh, takes up a lot of our time also. That is true. And, and the last example I'm going to use here, just because it's a little bit different, is U.S. Army. The, you know, it's a government military branch. They don't make product. Uh, they use licensing really to a couple of things. One, they want to ensure that there's quality products out there that are building a positive brand awareness. They're, they're avoiding people just using the trademark illegally and putting it on things that could be damaging to their brand because they use licensing as a recruitment a, a tool to be able to, to you know, get that brand in front of people, even at a very young age through toys. And then of course, um, most importantly to them, they use all of the funds from licensing to give back to the MWR, which is the Morale, Welfare and Recreation Program that supports all vets, um, active soldiers and their families. So on this last slide, I think we'll um, have Michael just quickly walk you through our client roster and, and a little bit about um, what we do, and then we can kick it over to the leadership piece. Okay, where is the last slide? Next slide. It's coming. <laughs> okay, so I'm not gonna talk very long about this. It just gives you an idea when the slide comes up, if it comes uh, up. Margaret, can you go to the next slide? There Great. we go. Thank you. It gives you an idea of the kind of companies that we represent uh, and uh, the kinds of brands that are out there doing licensing in a very active way. Uh, p and is, is our largest client. We work with about 20 brands there. Stanley Black & Decker is, I think, our second largest client. Diageo is our third line, largest client. That's Bailey's and, and, uh, and uh, you know, other yes. core brands. And we also do some digital brands you see in the bottom row, uh, video games, things like that. Uh, so it's a pretty eclectic group of clients, but mostly focused on, you know, names that are well-known brands. Uh, and, and other than the video game portion of our business, not a lot of entertainment brands. Occasionally we represent a celebrity uh, or something like that. We, for, for, the, for the women who are listening now, maybe when they were young girls, they remember the, the Mary Kate and Ashley uh, fashion program that, we, that, uh, that was very successful in the early 2000s. Uh, and we developed that program for, for the girls. So anyway, that gives you an idea of the kind of clients we recommend, we uh, represent. So I think, um, you know, moving away from the slides, we can really talk more to each other. And Michael, now that we're celebrating our 30th year of Beansock, which is exciting, it's, it's interesting. I'd like to hear how, you know, your career path led you to trademark, trademark licensing, since we all know it's not really something that comes up a lot in your undergrad. No, it doesn't. Uh, and, you know, when, when I think about my career path, when I look back on 30 years, it makes me think about one of my favorite quotes, which I think, Karen, you've heard me use multiple times. There's a, there's a famous American philosopher named Je Joseph Campbell uh, died a while ago. And, and I'm paraphrasing here, but one of his quotes that has stuck with me is that if you can see the path ahead of you, it's not your path. So if you can see the path ahead of you, it's not your path. And if someone had told me that 30 years ago, I would have said, yeah, I know exactly where I'm headed. I know what I'm doing. I have a goal. I know where I want to be in five and 10 years. So I'm not buying into that so much. But as I look back on a 30 year career, I realize how true that quote is because my journey, as I suspect all of your journeys, uh, took many twists and turns. Uh, many of most of them unexpected. I mean, I started out, you know, uh, as a child of the late '60s, early '70s, very social and politically active time. Um, I went to law school with the intention of being a poverty lawyer, representing you know, poor people in civil litigation, worked for legal services the entire time I was in law school, was offered a job with legal services, and then all of a sudden realized I can't make any money this way. How am I going to buy a car? How am I going to pay the rent? Uh, I'm out of school now. So I quickly pivoted and got a job with a federal judge. Uh, as a clerk, that job led me to a place that I never thought I would end up at, 
which was working for a big law firm representing corporations in New York City. It was like the antithesis of what I where I thought I was going. Uh, I didn't really want to be there, but the door, the job doors just opened up. So I took a job. I practiced law representing some pretty big companies uh, for four or five years, hated it. Uh, but one of the things that we did was represent uh, the consumer products division in the, of the NFL. So I got very familiar with licensing by doing that. And I had a buddy who was not too happy practicing law. And I said, hey, I think there's something to this licensing thing. Doesn't seem to be a lot of companies, corporations doing it. They have famous names too. It was mostly, you know, cartoon characters and movies and Disney and all of that back then. And so, you know, there we were. You know, we started an agency, a licensing agency back in 1992. Uh, and we were two young lawyers who said we were in the licensing business and the legal department of the Coca-Cola company found us. They went into licensing for legal reasons. They wanted to protect their trademark. We were lawyers who said we knew something about licensing. And uh, we got hired on a, for a very small fee by the Coca-Cola company, which at the time was the most famous trademark in the world. And that led, you know, to other clients. You know, we were the guys representing Coca-Cola. So that worked in our favor. And there I was, you know, beginning a 30 year career in licensing, which has been, you know, very reward, rewarding, very successful and ever changing. So what I can say to all of you is don't rely on the path that you see ahead of you and learn to expect the unexpected because that, that's what's going to happen. You know, look outside your comfort zone because your careers will take many twists and turns and you won't be able to see around the bend all the time. How about you, Karen? How did you find your way to licensing? Um, that could not be more true for me. I certainly did not see my path ahead. I graduated college, went right into PR, worked at Revlon, really as a temp to perm position. They weren't hiring full time. Started to really like it. They wanted to hire me full time until all of a sudden they told me I couldn't take the job because somebody else was being offered it. And coincidentally, that was the Monica Lewinsky scandal that actually she was taking that role, which she never really started for since... The news broke and some of you may be too young to know who she is, but you can Google her. Um, and <laughs> I, I know, <laughs> I then ended up uh, being moved into licensing. I had no idea what it was. So thank you, Monica, for that. Um, and then I was really excited about the work I was doing, but not truly excited about the culture at Revlon due to everything I'd gone through. Um, so I looked into other licensing jobs and found out that there are these licensing agencies that do multiple brands, who knew, um, and actually interviewed with our now CEO, who was a director at the time, and I was her first hire. So I've been with the company quite, quite some time and, and very happy that Michael did that 30 years ago where he decided to start Beanstalk. So enough about me. Um, Michael, so really this, this whole series is about leadership. So I'd love to hear, you know, your definition uh, of leadership and how that jumps post with your definition of entrepreneur and also what does a manager do? You know, it's, it's, uh, this whole, it, this whole topic of leadership is really, really fascinating to me because I just mentioned, I sort of fell into licensing. I, I never went to business school. I never worked for a business other than a law firm. Uh, and I don't know anything about leadership. I didn't even know it was something I needed to pay attention to. Uh, so it's, it wasn't that I even thought to, to learn about leadership. And I wish I had, uh, because I made a lot of mistakes in the first sort of decade of my career as sort of, a, you know, a, 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 someone who became a leader without even thinking about it. Um, so I, in, in the years since I have studied leadership, I've attended classes on leadership, I've, I've, I've learned an off, I've written about it, I've learned a lot about leadership sort of on the fly, which is not always the best way to do it, but I, I think I've become a good leader. And so my definition of, of a leader is, uh, is that a leader is really an instrument of change. A leader is someone who has to keep all of the employees of the company invested in a purpose, invested in wonder, invested in a sense of why they do what they do. And that's something that a leader has to be thinking about all the time. Sure, I always had accounts I worked on and clients and, and problems I solved and things like that. But at the end of the day, 
It's about change and making sure that the organization is keeping up and reinventing itself and resilient and changing all the time. And the employees understand what they're doing and why they're doing it. Separate from that is the is an entrepreneur, right? I was an entrepreneur. I started a business. It was a startup. We didn't call it startups back then, but it was a startup. Uh, so I was an entrepreneur. And so, you know, how does the definition of lead, how does a leader juxtapose with an entrepreneur? So an entrepreneur, to my way of thinking, is someone who relentlessly pursues opportunity, relentlessly pursues opportunity without regard to the resources currently controlled. So someone who relentlessly pursues opportunity without regard to resources currently controlled. So you're just, you're just forging ahead, you know, you're a, you're a bull in a china shop, just going forward. And at the same time, though, if you're successful as an entrepreneur, entrepreneur, you need to be, you need to be paying attention to yourself as a leader. Uh, and so it's, it's it's an interesting juxtaposition because you're trying to lead people, you're trying to give them a sense of why they do what they do, what they do. Meanwhile, you're pushing at the organization forward, really without enough resources to do what you want to do. Uh, so it's an interesting sort of time. And then on top of all of that, you have people that are called managers, and the managers sort of keep the system operating. You know, they're the people that day to day just keep keep the machine going, keep the gears turning. So you have this juxtaposition, I think, of leader, entrepreneur, and manager. And one of the things I've always tried to do is to keep the entrepreneurial spirit alive at Beanstalk, even though, you know, we're, we're 100 people now, we're one of the largest agencies in the world, we have offices all over the place. Uh, we're part of a huge, you know, $16 billion holding company. That, but I think for me as a leader, the key has always been to keep people feeling like they're entrepreneurs, like we're pursuing opportunity and we really don't have enough resources to do what we want to do, but we're going to do it anyway. Uh, and so, you know, it's 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 been an interesting journey for me and it's just really a wonderful journey. I've really enjoyed it. Well, you are a fabulous leader and one of my greatest mentors. So. Oh, well, thank you for that. That, is, that goes without saying. <laughs> um, so over this, you know, the, 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 the journey that you've come across um, becoming a leader, what are the things that you would share that you've learned throughout that process? You know, I, I, I've, I've learned so many things. I could spend a day on this. And uh, actually, I'm in the middle of writing an article, you know, 30 things I've learned in 30 years. And, and uh, you know, I'm having trouble cutting it down to 30. Uh, <laughs> I mean, there's just so many things. But one of the things I've tried to do is sort of, come up with little phrases for myself to remind myself of, of some of the things I've learned. So for example, culture matters. When I started the agency, just like leadership, I never knew that there was such a thing as corporate culture and that you had to pay attention to it. You know, And what I've learned over the years is that a culture has to be articulated by the leader. It has to be nurtured by the leader. It starts at the top, it cascades down. And that it's something that always have to be has to be worked on. I, I had a partner when we started Beanstalk. We were together for, uh, let's see, 12, 13 years before we sold the business to Omnicom. And then he left. And when I discovered that when we were co-CEOs and when I became the full-time CEO, uh, sole CEO, I realized that our culture really was bad. Uh, it was like two separate companies. It was his company and my company, my people and his people, my management style and his management style. And uh, it was something that I had to focus on and fix intentionally. Uh, and it, it was difficult, you know, culture really makes a big difference. So culture matters. Another thing I learned is people first, services second, profit third. Focus on the right people in the right jobs, engage them, take a personal interest in each of them and consistently deliver on your service promise and the profits will come. Don't focus on the money, focus on the people, then focus on the service and the profits will come. So people first, service is second, profits third. Also, another thing that I love to say to people, and I've stolen this from one of my colleagues at Omnicom who wrote a book of this title, 
is it's not what you say, it's what they hear. So people don't always hear what you're saying. So make sure that you know how to communicate, make sure you know how to write, make sure you know how to speak so that what people are hearing is actually what you are saying, because it's often not the case. The other thing I've learned is to ask myself a question and ask all of our leaders at the agency the same question, what keeps you up at night? What are you thinking about at night? Because what keeps you up at night is probably the big business issue, the big obstacle, the big opportunity. So focus on that. Understand what's keeping you up at night is probably the most important thing. And I'll say two more other things. Hire for attitude, not for skills. And you've probably heard that before. I've always thought really important to hire people who have the right attitude because I can't teach them how to have the right attitude. I can teach them the skills. I can teach them licensing, but I can't teach them attitude. And if they have the wrong attitude, they're the wrong person ultimately for our agency. And finally, you know, as a leader, and this is true for any leader in any position, make sure your deeds and actions match your words. Uh, you know, we say a lot, we talk a lot to our employees, we talk about grandiose things, we set strategies, we drive a culture, and leaders have to make sure that their deeds and their actions are, are that they're setting a personal example and that their actions and deeds match their words. So those just a handful of things I've learned, you know, little, little quotes, little things that I keep in my head to remind myself uh, how to do my job well. So to sum that up, what would you say makes a successful leader? Well, I think to be a really successful leader, first thing you have to do is set a direction for the company. So set a direction, you know, and, and be clear about it because all, am, remember this, all ambiguous messages and strategies will be interpreted negatively. So if you are ambiguous about something, if, if uh, about anything, about a strategy, about your behavior, it will be interpreted negatively. So be very clear on what the direction is of the company. Then once you've, you've got that direction, you have to gain commitment to the direction. If, you fail, if, I, if I as a leader fail to get people on board with the direction that I've set, they'll sabotage the direction because they're not on board. There, and there's always a sort of a gravitational pull for people to feel left out. So you have to make sure that everyone feels included. That's a cultural thing, uh, but you have to have the direction before you can work on an, you sort of an inclusionary culture. So you set a direction, you gain commitment to the direction, then you have to execute the direction. And that means taking responsibility for it, being accountable for it, uh, and making sure that the direction is being executed. And finally, what I said before, set a personal example. This is, this is at the center of it all. Uh, as a leader, you have to set a personal example on executing and believing in the direction. You know, do your people trust you? I ask that question to myself all the time. Do the people at Beanstalk trust me when they're with me? Do they want to support me or do they want to choke me? And, you know, of course, I want them to feel like they want to support me and not choke me. And that's a question that leaders, I think, have to ask all the time. How do the people view you? Uh, you know, do your, ma do your actions match, match your words? You know, do they, are they, hearing, are they hearing, hearing what you're saying or are they not hearing what you're saying? All the things I said before uh, come into play uh, in terms of a personal example. I mean, you know, I don't want people to feel like they want to choke me. And there are a lot of leaders out there whose employees feel like, you know, I hate this guy. And it's not easy to gain commitment when people feel that way. I've never wanted to choke him. Thank you. It's good to know. But don't <laughs> start today. No. Especially since you work with the U.S. Army, you know, you're not a lot of guys. That's right. Here, you know. yeah. And I'm married to a Marine. So I'm married to a Marine, yeah. yeah. Um, so part of every leadership journey, there are fa failures. So talk to me about failure and how that's affected you. Well, first of all, you know, I think a lot of people say, you know, I'm strong. Failure is not an option. Uh, you know, and leaders stand in front of their teams and say, failure is not an option. I'm, I'm the opposite guy. To me, and I will emphasize the word is, failure 
is an option. Failure always is an option. Failure is not the opposite of success. Failure is the stepping stone to success. So don't be afraid of failure. And as a leader who's always trying to initiate change, I have to understand that in the middle of any change initiative, it will look like failure. It always does. Uh, and it's important for me to make sure there are no doubters around, cut the doubters loose. So don't worry about failure. You know, uh, one of the other things I always say is to do something well, you have to do it poorly first. So don't worry about failure. As I said, it is the stepping stone to success. It is not the opposite uh, of success. And another thing that I, that I believe uh, that you should think about when you think about failure is always have a plan B. Always have a plan B. And if we look around today at what's going on, we can see how important a plan B is. For example, it's a terrible example, but Vladimir Putin does not have a plan B. He had a plan A, it failed, and he didn't have a plan B. During the pandemic, we all had to find plan B. Uh, and there's a story I'll tell you, and if you wanna look up a great, great presentation, I'll, I'll mention it at the end of this little story. Uh, but the, in early March, I don't know if you noticed this, it was on the front page of the New York Times, Ernest Shackleton's ship was found in the, in the Arctic ice. Ernest Shackleton was a great British explorer of the early 1900s. In 1915, he set out on a voyage to be the first to cross the South Pole on foot. He set out with 20, 27 hardy souls and about 100, maybe 200 miles short of the South Pole, his ship, which was called the Endurance, interestingly enough, ironically enough, the Endurance got stuck in the ice. Shackleton's ship was stuck on the ice for 15 months. The men lived on the ship, they lived on the ice, they had a lot of provisions, so they were able to survive. It was stuck on the ice for 15 months, they were waiting for the ice to melt so they could keep going. Instead of melting, the, the ice started crushing the ship when it started finally to melt. And ultimately, the ship sank. They took all of the provisions they could off the ship, and they lived on the ice. Shackleton needed a plan B, and he needed a plan B fast. He managed to get, he had three lifeboats, one they lost. They dragged them across the ice. They finally found some rocky island where they were able to put the ships in the water, the lifeboats in the water, and they, and they made it to this rocky island. There was no civilization there. And Shackleton realized if they, no one knew where they were, World War I had started. So he realized he had to figure out a way to get back to civilization. So he and five guys got in a lifeboat and crossed 800 miles of probably the most treacher, treacherous seas in the world and managed to get to, to civilization. He then spent four months raising money to get another ship to go back. And miraculously, all the guys were still alive. So he saved everybody. He had multiple plan Bs along the way. And they just found his ship at the beginning of March uh, under the ice in the Arctic, very well preserved because the water is so cold. Uh, he had to have multiple plan Bs. And Shackleton is really the master of plan B. And if you, if you want to see a great lecture, look Google Nancy Cohen, K-O-E-H-N, uh, her lecture about a crisis of leadership, Ernest Shackleton and Abraham Lincoln. Uh, and you can find the video of her lecture. It is one of the best lectures I've ever seen. Lincoln is first, then she does Shackleton. So if you just want to see Shackleton, just go to the middle. But, you know, that's one of the ways to avoid failure, I think, is to always have a plan B. Uh, and, uh, you know, and the Shackleton story, and Professor Cohen's uh, lecture on it has stuck with me for many, many years. So I was thrilled to see them find his ship, you know, at the beginning of March. But think about plan B, always have a plan B. So a question came in then. Um, yes, you can, you know, failure is always an option, but if you do fail, how do you recommend addressing and recovering from it? Well, first I think, you know, I like to tell people, uh, feel free to make any decision that can be undone. 
you know, and so the question first is, can the decision you've made be undone? Uh, can the failure be undone? Maybe it can. So figure out how to undo it. Uh, or maybe it can't. And, uh, you know, so if you failed, you need to understand why you failed, learn from it and move on. And one thing I will say about failures, and I tell this to people all the time, because when you fail, you feel horrible about it. That's what keeps you up at night. You know, I failed, I failed, I failed. I didn't do this right. Something went wrong. Whatever you fail at today, however, however a big failure you might think it is today, a year from now, you will not even remember that failure. That's how inconsequential it ultimately will be. You won't remember it. The failures of today will not be remembered in a year. So just get some, have get a reality check on the failure. Uh, it's not. It's not the end. It's almost never the end of the world. Uh, and let's put Vladimir Putin aside here for a minute. Um, but you know, failures are generally not the end of the world. You can recover from them. Sometimes you can undo them. Sometimes you can learn from them and move on you know they say make make lemonade out of lemons and often you can do that often you can you can find a better a better way to do what you failed at than than the way that you had tried you know one of the things i say about plan a, a is sometimes plan a is just try harder on plan a sometimes plan b rather sometimes plan b is just try harder at plan a uh and so you know, sometimes you fail and you can go back and and just try harder. Uh, just try to fix what, what you failed at. Um, sometimes there's a fix, but sometimes not. And, you know, you just have to learn from it, move on and realize in a year from now, I'm not going to remember this. Uh, I'm not going to remember this failure. It's, it's going to be just, you know, in my history book uh, of my journey here. So, you know, I 30 years, I've had more failures than I can possibly remember. And none of them mean anything to me now. And they all drove me crazy at the time. So on a positive note, how do you empower your employees? Well, as I said before, motivate for, them. First, the, the first way to the first way to motivate employees is to, as I said before, hire for attitude, train for skills. By the way, that's an Ernest Shackleton quote. Also, he hired for attitude, not for skills, because he needed people who could go on this horrible journey. His, his newspaper ad for, for people to join him on this journey said that you probably won't come back. Uh, so, you know, you needed people with a certain attitude. But I think that it's important to build teams. The most powerful creative force is the group. Recognize that everyone has the potential to be a creative thinker and idea developer. We often bring our finance people, you know, who manage royalty collection into brainstorm sessions because everyone, anyone can have an idea. Uh, as I said before, you need to create confidence in senior management and that management can eliminate obstacles. Your employees need to know and feel good that you can eliminate obstacles for them. Uh, you know, it's tough to be a high performing team if there are obstacles in the way. And I think it's the leader's job to help overcome those obstacles. I think it's also important for people to get stretch work. And that's particularly important of young people now, Gen, Gen Z. Uh, you know, people want stretch work. Uh, we don't want to overload people. We don't want them to feel guilty that they don't have enough time to do what they're assigned to do. They don't, we, don't want, we don't want them to feel like they have to abandon one thing to do another. Uh, we want them to encourage, and we want to encourage them to share that dilemma when they face it. But I think it's important to give employees stretch work. Uh, and, I, you know, I think it's important to give a lot of feedback. You know, a lot of companies give performance reviews halfway through the year, at the end of the year. To me, feedback on the run is always better than none. Walk out of, meeting, walk out of a meeting with someone, give them feedback. Give them the good feedback, give them the bad feedback. Uh, and I think it's important for leaders to understand what drives the best talent. As I mentioned, I think stretch work does. Um, and it's important not to get employees focused on the boring, unchallenging work. There always is boring and unchallenging work, but make sure that they have challenging work. And, and at the end of the day, one of the things I've learned over the years, and I hate to say this to all of you, but I'm gonna say it. I have to, as a leader, 
I have to accept that I will never be able to fully meet people's expectations. People will always have disappointments. They always have high expectations and I cannot meet all of them. Uh, and I have to accept that fact. I can't keep trying to make everybody satisfied, everybody happy. Uh, it's just it's just not an option. Um, everyone will have something that they're disgruntled about. But I think if I do all the other things that I talked about, I think, you know, that that will help motivate employees. You know, and I'll I'll throw it back to you, Karen. You know, how would you motivate employees? What's your what's your leadership style? You're you know, you're one of the senior leaders of our agency and have been for a long time. So, you know, how would you describe what you do as a leader? Well, I mean, you touched on some of this and, and the beauty of, I think, our leadership team, which you can probably attest to, is that we have many different types of leadership styles. Um, mine, I would say, is somewhat of a pace setter. I like to get my hands dirty and help where I can. And I like to move fast and make sure my team is you know, joining me for the journey. But, but more importantly, I think I'm, I, I like being a mentor, which I hope makes me a good mentor. And I, I try to keep that team motivated, engaging in celebrations, keeping them you know, active together, um, really team meetings, everything we can to really ensure that we're working as a collaborative group. And then I also believe that I'm, I'm somewhat protective of them, which may or may not be a good thing, but I do lead with empathy because these are whole human beings that are working with us on a day to day. Um, but I think what people would say if they had to say something about me is that I, I try to lead by example. I am a get it done girl. Um, that is just who I am. And, you know, in, in, to wrap it up, just in, in order to motivate the team, and, and Michael, you touched on this, but it's so important is we have to be transparent with them at all times as much as possible. So they understand how they're laddering up to the overall goals of the agency because understanding this across all the team and all the dif disciplines within our agency allows us to support one another and ensure that we're going for the ultimate win and i think that's what really motivates motivates us the most instead of just being the day-to-day -day person you're really understanding how that's going to ladder up to the ultimate goal uh, trans so, i think transparency is really really important and yeah when i was first developing the culture at beanstalk you know 15 16 years ago uh transparency was the key word you know just be transparent with people and you know for the first time when i took over as the sole ceo we disclosed as you may recall karen um you know financial information how the agency was doing financially yeah it goes a long way and and obviously i learned i learned a lot from you and and our ceo allison so that's why a lot of those you know key things are coming out but it does it goes a long way for the team and you've been doing this for a long time. You've had your failures, you've had your successes. What do you believe um, all of this knowledge has led you to having to reinvent yourself over the years or evolve yourself over the years? Well, this, what, I've, what I've recognized looking back <laughs> is that there was an enormous amount of reinvention. Personally, I had to understand all the things that we've talked about already. I had to learn that to do the right things well you have to do them poorly first i had to learn that it's okay to be insecure uh i had to learn that it's okay to fail we don't want to fail we're high achievers all of us we need the courage to go to places that where 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 we feel insecure so that was a real personal sort of journey of constant reinvention in terms of the business that they were in we're in uh, we're in an industry that is constantly changing and touches so many aspects of commerce uh it's about brands it's about marketing it's about consumers it's about retailers so think of all the things that have changed in those areas you know so i'm always thinking about what are the, what are the negatives and stereotypes about our industry how have they changed how is our business model viewed now compared to the past how is our model viewed by clients clients have gotten smarter how have clients' expectations changed? Do the old tactics still work? How has the world changed? How has retail changed? How have consumers changed? Uh, you know, are we changing? Are we keeping up with all of this? What skills are important? You know, I mean, this year we've had to learn about NFTs. Uh, now we're learning about the metaverse. I mean, so much change is going on that affects our industry. You know, uh, delivering messages to consumers has gotten so much more complicated. So our work has changed and is changing at such an accelerated pace now 
uh, that we need to, to understand those changes and constantly being reinventing ourselves. Uh, and you know, in that regard, I've, I've learned that I have to stay focused, that I can do only one thing at a time. I can't do many things at a time. And I've learned that I have to, and this is important, I think, for everybody, I have to manage my energy, not my time. I have to manage my energy. Uh, and I think that's important for everybody to know. Don't worry about managing time, manage energy. Yeah. And, uh, the, and, the, and the other thing I'd say is, you know, I've met a lot of celebrities and a lot of senior executives and a lot of corporate giants in my time. And, I, I, and I've learned not to be intimidated by people. You know, you have to learn that everybody puts their pants on the same way, right? One leg at a time. And, and, and you know, people are people. Just don't be intimidated by them. And, and you, Karen, I mean, you've had to re do pivot to an enormous reinvention over the past two years, managing all the licensing programs that you do for your clients, because the pandemic required, as I said earlier, pivot to plan B's all over the place, right? Plan A no, it was thrown out the window when the pandemic came in terms of how we yeah. do business. So why don't you talk a little bit about how you had to pivot during the pandemic? Famous, famous pandemic pivot. I that yeah. uh, you know those words. I think we hear so often and love so much. Uh, I will say that although we needed to shift, and we did, the one thing that we never strayed from, which really it it, it kept us together and was so important, were our values, our choice. That is an acronym, values, which stands for commitment, humility, one team, innovation, community, and empowerment. So. Through all of this, um, you know, not only did we continue to gain new clients, we developed licensing programs to prepare just our existing and, and new clients for, you know, the future ahead, the new future ahead that we were about to to embark on, and, and also look at, you know, different uh, retail channels like e-commerce versus brick and mortar, and really, you know, ensure they had a strong strategy there since we knew that was going to thrive. And then also looking at categories, what we called pandemic proof categories. You know, Diageo is a good example, the alcohol brands that we talked about, really shifting the focus from that neighborhood bar to the stay at home bar. And what does that mean? Or things around food, because we knew that supermarkets were going to remain open. And of course, for our clients like Stanley Black and Decker, where home improvement was really growing, everyone was home and had the time and, and also P&G that had cleaning products and things that were in extremely important. We really focused on what, what worked for our, for our teams, um, for our clients. But really the dynamic that, that I think came out of this, at least for me, you know, we had to shift the way we work together as a team. And there was a huge upside to this shift that I don't think people realized until it happened, which was, we're actually getting to work more collaboratively than we ever worked before. Seeing our teams in Europe and Miami and Latin America, FaceTiming with them or Zoom or, or Meets, whatever you use, being part of that collaborative face-to-face, -face, even though it's not in person, allowed us to not have this home field advantage where, oh, a phone call was being led out of one of the offices and everybody else was just a member on the call. Now everyone has equal playing time. So everyone's seeing each other and working together and allowed us to collaborate in a way that we had never done before. And it shifted the way that we work together and really did spark an outpouring of creativity and innovation that allowed us to respond to the shift of our, our client. You know, we have a huge client portfolio and they are diverse. So all of that really benefited us and it allows us to get out of our comfort zones. Um, but also we talked about responsibility, which is something that I know is one of the R's here. And yeah, there was a pandemic going on, but there was also a lot of other things going on in the world. And Beanstalk had, had you know, always really focused, it's part of our DNA to give back and have you know, this charitable activity connection that, that we were a part of, which we called hands-on, but we couldn't be hands-on through the pandemic. Um, so we really looked at what was happening and, and decided to react to it while we were remote. And it also allowed us to be more collaborative by, you know, giving um, the team an opportunity to build a, an entire new part of our practice, which we call the AAA group. And that is the anti-racism allyship in action, which really its intent is to educate and allow people to discuss and, and empower the diversity of the agency 
um, as well as continue to advocate for, for just the, the marginalized group. So, you know, all of this negative that came out of the shift really allowed us to look at it from a positive lens and build our culture in a new way. And now we continue to do that, even though we're back to a hybrid, you know, one or two day a week schedule, it's just building a stronger dynamic. So I don't know how much time we have left, so I'm going to leave it to you for some final words. So we have some time left for, for Q&A, if there are any. Sure. Uh, we just, I'll just take a couple of more minutes, you know, and give you some, give you all some final words of wisdom or not, depending on how you receive it. Uh, you know, just some, some final thoughts, you know, for you to think about as you, as you embark upon your, your career journeys. You know, I think it's important every now and then at the end of the day to ask yourself, was this a good day? Was this a good day? And by the way, if you spent the whole day answering emails and responding to phone calls, all of which are urgent things, it probably wasn't such a good day because you've let the urgent work get in the way of the important stuff. You know, there's always really important things to do at work, but they don't have the urgency of phone calls and emails. So make sure you're not, you know, just pushing papers around all day and keeping busy, but not getting to the important stuff. So ask yourself at the end of the day, was this a good day? Um, the other thing that I, that I like to say is a lot of people say, you know, ask consumers what they want and then give it to them. That's how you'll be successful. I don't believe that. I believe that you give consumers what you believe they should want. Think about what you think consumers should want. That's the harder question. What should they want and give them that? You know, back in the day when Henry Ford was alive, if he had asked consumers, well, what do you want? They would have said, you know what we want? We want faster horses. So, you know, ask yourself what consumers should want and give it to them. Uh, another thing that someone once asked me, and I thought was really, really a, a great question to ask. Imagine it's the end of your life. What are the three most important lessons you've learned and why are they critical? It's the end of your life. What are the three most important lessons you've learned? And I guarantee you that one of the lessons will not be, I should have worked harder. You will not say to yourself on your deathbed, I should have worked harder. Uh, the other thing that I think people need to know is don't stop dreaming. You know, you can't, dreams can't come true if you don't have dreams. Uh, so a big dream will sort of always come out of the fog. It'll always come out of the swamp and you get there step by small step. It's not, you know, just some big thing that unfolds. You know, you have to lean in, you have to be confident. You have to embrace your ambitions. Don't doubt your abilities, you know, be passionate, be a passionate advocate for yourself and your ideas and your You'll, you'll make your dreams come true. You really will. And I'll, I'll end with a final little story that David Foster Wallace told at a famous graduation speech. I totally encourage you to find his speech. He was a famous American author. He gave a commencement speech at Kenyon College in 2005. And he started with this little story, which I've never forgotten. There are these two young fish swimming along in the water, and they happen to meet an older fish swimming the other way who nods at them and says, morning, boys, how's the water? And the two young fish swim on for a bit. And then eventually one of them looks over at the other and asks, what the heck is water? And the, the moral of that story is, and this is what I'll leave you with, opportunity is all around you. You just have to see it. Thank you, Michael. That's, we love that. Um, there are some questions. So I don't know if we have time for those. I'm going to hopefully be able to get please to yes take, okay, take a couple questions i see there's one here um what advice would you give to someone starting out in business in this current climate you know with the changes and and penetrating markets well of course it depends what business you're trying to get into but there are in in sort of our neck of the woods which is consumer products and retail uh there are so many exciting things going on right now uh, and there is so much opportunity to, to sort of find your place in this sort of ever, ever changing world. And although things are changing rapidly, you know, I, I like to say that what's, what's new is what, what's old is new again. You know, there's all this new stuff happening, but a lot of it is, is you know, is not so new. If I was to say to you that, you know, consumers now can, 
buy anything they want from a single source and get it delivered to their home. Uh, you would say, you would say, and I said, who am I talking about? You'd say, you're talking about Amazon. And I'd say, no, I'm not. I'm talking about the early 1900s when the railroads were built across America and the US Postal Service improved its services. And all of a sudden, people could get catalogs, a single source, order anything they wanted, and it was delivered to their home by mail. And so, you know, Amazon is just a repeat of what happened 150 years ago. So there are so many, so many places now. Business is such, such a changing environment now. There are so many places to inject yourself. And for people looking for jobs now, you know, it's a, it's a job seekers market. I will tell you that, you know, there's all these articles about the great resignation. People are moving around. Uh, companies have lots of openings. They're looking for talented people. Uh, and so I think, you know, pick your spot, pick the kind of thing that you want to do and then just, just go attack it because there are, there are opportunities out there. Remember, there's water all around you. That's right. Um, I think that's it for the, the Q&A box unless, Margaret, you had any other questions. Okay, so there were a couple of other questions that I uh, received. Um, we had someone, and um, I don't know if we'll be able to get to all of you, but I'll make sure that Karen and Michael receive all of your questions, and perhaps we can get back to some, you know, folks uh, individually. Um, but uh, someone was asking about the licensing of currently unbranded um, products. So for something that uh, someone who has no experience in this, you know, how do they get uh, started? Well, it's very hard to license unbranded products because licensing really is about fame. Uh, you know, uh, licensing follows fame. So we need to, to successfully license a brand. The brand has to have some degree of fame among a large enough consumer group in order to convince another company to pay you to use that brand on their product. Don't forget, we're going to companies saying, pay us, pay our client to use Mr. Clean on your product. It will help you sell more product. So they have to be convinced that, that they're paying for something that is worthwhile. Now, if you have a, a new product that's a great idea and it's, it's sort of revolutionary, it's something new, uh, you might be able to find somebody who thinks this is a great idea it's a protected idea. This guy owns the idea. And so I'll license the idea and I'll launch the product. I'll launch the brand. But as an agency, if someone comes, people come to us with ideas all the time that they want to license, and we, we generally turn them down unless they have some, unless their, their product has some degree of fame um, within a large enough consumer group to make it worthwhile for somebody else to pay to use that to use that brand or product. Well, I'm going to flip that though, because yeah, you can't license out something that people don't know, but if you have a product and you have an ability to sell that product and you have proven track record and, and you could use a brand to actually market that product better because it's a great product, but people probably don't know the brand on it because it's, you know, Mr. Brand or whatever you're calling it, licensing a brand for your product or your, your company is also a route as long as you have a proven track record for most licensors. Yeah, that's a, that's a great comment. I mean, imagine you've, in, you've invented or come up with a great idea for a new, you know, carpet cleaner or something like that. And, and you got a good track record with some sales, but you'd do a lot better if you had a really famous brand attached to it. You know, go out and license a brand from somebody, license a famous name and put it on your product, like Mr. Clean or something like that. Well, uh, that's fantastic. And I have to say in the time since we, um, you know, made arrangements for you guys to, uh, to join us, all I've noticed are all the branding things around me as I slipped my feet into my, you know, Batman Crocs and, you know, picked up different, you know, products, um, uh, including something from Bailey's, you know, um, off the shelf. Um, so, um, yeah, uh, it's, uh, I find it more and more fascinating than, than I even know, knew to do so um, beforehand. So I thank you. And I know our audience does uh, as 
well. And again, for the folks, if we didn't get to your uh, question, I'll make sure that Karen and Michael get it so that we can, um, you know, get an answer to you. But uh, since we've reached kind of the witching hour, I just want to make sure that we think um, on behalf of Dean Lee's lifelong learning team and all of my colleagues here at Rutgers Business School, you know, thank you so much, Michael and Karen, for being here and enlightened us on uh, leadership, licensing, and branding. And I particularly enjoyed hearing about both of your leadership journeys and the conversation was extremely informative and relevant. I wanna thank our audience too, because they had uh, great questions. And um, for 2023 fiscal year, which starts for us uh, July 1st, the RBS Signature Leadership Series will be on the move. So look for our webinars on Fridays in even numbered months. And for more information, you can always visit uh, the webpage, business.rutgers.edu slash alumni slash lifelong dash learning. Don't anyone who's here live worry about uh, recording that because that um, we will be sending you an email, but that's just for people who are listening to it later. Um, the exciting schedule of topics and presenters that we always have lined up for you is thanks to wonderful suggestions from the audience, and we appreciate those. So we'll encourage you to keep sharing great ideas um, by uh, submitting them in um, one of the questions in the survey that's headed your way. Um, there is a book available from Michael and we'll be including in our follow up communication with you information on how to get that via Amazon. Um, and lastly, I mentioned this when our webinar began, but a link to the archive recording of the presentation will be shared via social media and email to those who registered and will also appear on the business insights page of our website. So thank you so much, Karen and Michael, and thanks to everyone who joined us today. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.